This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 6. Guys, before we get into the content for today, which whew, it's going to be a tough one, but I just want to thank all the guys that are partnering with us on a monthly basis and are donating to our ministry. Again, as I've talked about a lot before, we do not sell anything other than t-shirts, which we basically don't make any money off of, but we have guys that are partnering with us on a one-time basis, but also on a monthly basis because they know that this is important content. They want it to get out to more people, and that is how we have to do this, guys, because when we accept donations, we put that right back into the ministry to figure out ways to get this content out to more guys like you. So thank you to those guys that are already doing that. But if you would like to help us out as well, you can go to our website, www.undaunted.life backslash donate. Again, guys are dropping into in a one-time deal, but also we have guys that are hopping in, uh, you know, basically across the board. They want to help us on a monthly basis because they're looking at their budgets. They're like, yeah, I support this every month and this every month. I want to support something that's doing really, really good work. So obviously we would ask you guys to consider doing that. Now I'm just going to go ahead and get into the subject matter for today. And I'll just be real honest with you guys from the very, very beginning. Preparing for this episode was incredibly difficult. It was incredibly taxing on my brain because I wanted to talk about a lot of different things. And anytime you're tackling a subject where there's a lot of different tendrils coming off of it, you got to make sure that you're doing a good job. But I was just angry. I, I was furious. I was so mad at points during this this episode research that I could spit nails. And I, I even apologized to my wife because whenever I was doing most of this research, I was like, man, I was not being very nice. But it was like the, the subject matter was absolutely weighing on me because here we are. We're back to normalizing pedophilia. Like, I literally cannot believe that this has turned into a series, right? So I did a Race in America series. I did the Botching Afghanistan series. But now normalizing pedophilia, I guess it's going to be a thing now, okay? Because episode 87 of this podcast was called Normalizing Pedophilia. I kind of brought some things up there. And then in episode 152, I visited it again because we're talking about basically the normalization of P as the LGBTQ plus P is kind of where we're at now. So I would definitely suggest you go back and listen to those episodes to kind of give you an idea of kind of where we're at and how we got to where we are today. But this particular episode was inspired by a mother a, and a courageous and brave mother that brought the fire to a recent school board meeting. So her name is Stacy Langton. A lot of you guys have seen this, but she went to the Fairfax County, Virginia school board meeting on September the 23rd of 2021. And uh, I'm going to show the video here in a second, but shout out to do better FCPS. I think that's Fairfax County public schools for the video. Uh, I want to make sure that they get credit for this. So it will be in the show notes, but guys, I'm just going to tell you from the jump explicit content warning. For this video, but also for the rest of the podcast, because we're we're not going to pull any punches with this. We're going to get right into some of the content that is going into your kids' ears, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and play the clip for you here. After seeing a September 9th school board meeting in Texas on pornography in the schools, I decided to check the titles at my child's school, Fairfax High School. The books were available, and we checked them out. Both of these books include pedophilia, sex between men and boys. Both books describe different acts. One book describes a fourth grade boy performing oral sex on an adult male. The other book has detailed illustrations of a man having sex with a boy. The illustrations include fellatio, sex toys, masturbation, and violent nudity. Pedophilia here. From the author, Maya Kobabe. Quote, I can't wait to have your cock in my mouth. I am going to give you the blowjob of your life, and then I want you inside me. End quote. From the author, Jonathan Evison. What if I told you I touched another guy's dick? What if I told you I sucked it? I was 10 years old, but it's true. I sucked Doug Goebel's dick, the real estate guy, and he sucked mine too. This is not an oversight at Fairfax I'm High sorry. School. I'm sorry. This I, yes. may I material. Please make a point of, there are children no. in the audience here. Do not Thank interrupt you. my time. Yes. Do not interrupt my time. I would like to remind everybody. I will stand here until my time is restored and my time is finished. 
These books are in stock and available in the libraries of Robinson, for high school Langley, students, ma and Annandale High School. Pornography is offensive um, to Clark. all people. It is offensive to common decency. It is the reason why the MPAA... Is our next speaker is... I mean, astonishing. Absolutely astonishing. I'm so glad she responded the way that she did. She didn't just keel over and be like, okay, roll over, play dead. But this clip should infuriate you guys for a myriad of reasons. So here are the, here are the ones that I just pulled off the top of my head. First of all, the school board authoritarians, right? They interrupted her during her speaking time which is just bad decorum, okay? She wasn't doing anything that was outside the pale of, of common decency. She was reading from books that were at her kid's school, okay? The second thing is that the school board authoritarians actually cut off her mic. Now, you know, they're looking around, like if you're watching the video, which I guys highly suggest that you watch it on our YouTube channel, but you're they're looking around at each other like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And then they just cut her mic off in the middle of her time. Again, she wasn't doing anything that was, you know... Uh, Worse than what these kids are already being exposed to. Another thing is the school board, school board authoritarians, a little bit tongue tied, but they actually edited the public video stream. So if you watch the video again, they edited the public video stream so that you couldn't see the pictures from the book that this mother showed. So it looked like the mother had blown up these pictures from the book, showing all these, you know, sex acts with children and like just opened them up and showed it to them and made sure all the school board can see them. But they changed the video to where it wasn't focused on the mother. So you couldn't see the pictures. It was uh, like a back shot where you couldn't see anything that should make you furious. Another thing is one of the school board authoritarians tried to smooth over this woman's rage, right? By explaining to her that, ma'am, these books are for high schoolers. I don't know if you caught that, but ma'am, these books are for high schoolers. As if that matters, right? Because again, these books were in middle schools, right? Or, or maybe like ninth grade area, but we're talking 13, 14 year olds. Ma'am, uh, ma'am, these aren't, these aren't for anybody. These are for high schoolers, high schoolers. Otherwise known as children, right? Below the age of 18. Another thing that I thought was crazy is one of the school board authoritarians feigning that they were actually trying to protect children that were in the room while simultaneously trying to silence the woman pointing out that these books were available to the children, such as the ones in the room to begin with absolute seared consciousness, unbelievable, but also a couple of things that, that should absolutely make your skin crawl is that these books were available in the library to begin with and that the mother had to dig to find them right? It wasn't just out there. She, she had seen something that went on in a different state and thought, I wonder if that's going on in my school. And then lo and behold, it was. Okay. So guys, there's a lot of reasons for today's show, but I want to kind of boil it down for you. The reasons for today's show to the first one, I guess, is to expose you to other stories like Stacey Langton's. Okay. Including guys, you're definitely going to want to stick around for this, including one from my own backyard from a school that is five to 10 minutes away from where I'm standing right now in my studio, okay? I'm going to eviscerate this school board, right? So you're going to stick around for that. But also a reason is I want to give you guys the tools to fight back against this darkness. Again, everything that we do, everything that you guys that are partnering with us are, are helping us do is equipping men to push back darkness. There is some crazy darkness in this area and most of you guys don't have the tools to fight back. We're going to help give them to you. And the last thing is just to wake you up. Again, I talk about parents all the time just being asleep at the wheel. No more. No more. We're going to do what we can, but you got to do what you do. Yeah, like you got to do some things as well. But let's go ahead and get into some other stories from around the country because just even doing a cursory glance and a cursory look, I found so many stories. And I just pulled the ones that, that I found first and put them on here, but there are so many more. So we're going to go into a bunch here. So the first one is from the Christian Post, and it's uh, I'll, read the, I'll basically read the title, and then we'll get into some different things. But here's the title. Here's the headline. Ohio mayor orders school board to resign or face criminal charges over child pornography taught in schools. Okay. So in this particular school district, so this is in the Hudson City Public School District in Ohio, they had writing assignments that they were given to these children. Okay. Here were some of the, the writing assignments that were given to these kids. Write a sex scene you wouldn't show your mom. Explain a time when you wanted to orgasm but couldn't. Describe your favorite part of a man's body using only verbs. And write an X rated Disney scenario. Yeah. Seriously, that was an English assignment, an English class, okay? But it doesn't just stop there. The teachers in this school district told the students not to take this writing prompt book home so their parents wouldn't know what they were writing about. They were trying to hide it from the parents, okay? 
So at the Hudson City School District Board of Education meeting that happened, I think it was four or five weeks ago now, Hudson Mayor Craig Schubert, a Republican, actually addressed the school board directly, and he said this. Earl, members of the board, my name is Craig Schubert. I'm the mayor of this city. It has come to my attention that your educators are distributing essentially what is child pornography in the classroom. I've spoken to a judge this evening. She's already confirmed that. So I'm going to give you a simple choice. You either choose to resign from this Board of Education or you will be charged. Thank you. I mean, you want to talk about a drop the mic moment. I mean, when we get a Republican back in the White House, we need to get this guy the Congressional Medal of Freedom. I absolutely love this. He was up there for, what, 30 seconds? And he just basically burned the place down. I loved it. Okay, so let's get into some more stories here. This is from Fox News. Texas mom erupts at school board over anal sex passage in middle schoolers' book. So reading from the article here, Kara Bell, a former school board candidate at Lake Travis Independent School District, read a sexually explicit passage from Out of Darkness by Ashley Hope Perez, uh, which she said could be found in at least two district middle schools. Take her out back, we boys figured, then hand on the titties, put it in her corn box, put it in her cornhole, grab a hold of that braid, rub that calico. Bell recited on the board of uh, to the board Wednesday night. You can find that on page 39 of the book called out of darkness, which you can find at Hudson bend middle school and B cave middle school. I do not want my children to learn about anal sex in middle school, said Bell, raising her voice before her mic was cut off. Yeah, they're doing that there too. You are not public health officials. You are not supposed or you are supposed to be educating our children. Okay, so that's from Fox News. Now we got CBN News. Here's a headline. Outrage. Six-year-old students told to write gay marriage proposal and love letter. So this is actually one from the UK. Reading from the article here. A controversy is brewing in the UK after a video surfaced last month showing a group of young students at a primary school in England being asked to write a same-sex love letter. BBC Radio's Man- uh, Radio Manchester posted a video detailing the LGBTQ lesson that was taught to children in Busey Lodge Primary School in Warrington, England. In the video, teacher Sarah Hobson instructed the class to pretend to be a fictional fairy tale character named Prince Henry and write a love letter to the prince's servant Thomas, explaining why they should get married. They are going to go out into the world and find this diversity around them, and they'll find that at a young age as well, Hobson told BBC. And the more they can be accepting at this age, you are not going to face it further on because the children will be accepting now and will be accepting this diversity around them right and and she just a sweetheart now another one from fox news so this is minnesota public school asks students to role play sex scenarios as gay or trans or as gay or trans activists take issue okay so i love how that's in the title like oh activists take issue yeah with the fact that they're telling students to act out gay and trans sex scenarios my goodness i mean let's go and get in the article here Activists spoke out against a sex ed program used in a Minnesota school district that includes asking straight students to role play gay and transgender relationships. The lessons include asking students to role play various relationship scenarios, including straight students pretending they were in a gay or lesbian relationship and to work through whether the hypothetical couple should have sex. In one of the lessons, the student is asked to pretend to be a male named Morgan, who is very active in his school's LGBTQ club, while another student is asked to be Terrence, a student who wants to have sex with Morgan and is not publicly out as gay. Morgan then outlines a plan for the two students to secretly meet according to the curriculum, and they make a decision about whether to have sex. Another lesson, uh, other lessons include having students pretend they are transgender and make a decision about having sex with a woman. Curriculum on anal sex designed for students in kindergarten through fifth grade in the context of HIV AIDS prevention and a section for teachers outlining some straight male students might have a homophobic response to the role playing. Ah, just keeps getting better. Now from the daily wire, Texas teachers instructed to help students hide gender identity from parents. From the article, a teacher training for a Texas public, Texas public school district directed teachers to hide information about students' gender identity from their parents in order to make a school a safe place. Teachers at Leander Independent School District north of Austin received a training presentation in October last year that instructed them to discuss gender identity with students, ask them whether it was okay to share the parents or to share the students' preferred pronouns with their parents. The training titled Supporting LGBTQ Plus Youth in Schools was led by two school social 
social workers working for the district, Felix Barnhart and Monica Kelly, who describes herself as fat positive and sex positive therapists. Add your pronouns wherever your name is published and then also whenever you are introducing yourself. Just to normalize the sharing of pronouns, Kelly suggested to participants in the training. Another idea, she said, is to let students identify themselves on the first day of class with their individual name and pronouns and make sure to inform substitute teachers and anyone else visiting the classroom of their correct pronouns. So that way it protects the student from being misgendered or called a name that they don't identify with. So that's just... A little bit from around the country. Again, I could have done a hundred more probably, but now we're going to get into my, my backyard here. I, I could not believe this story and it's going to take me a while for, to, to unpack this, but just buckle up. So I'm putting Deer Creek public schools on notice. Okay. Specifically their elementary schools. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, the school in question, which I can't name the exact one, and I'll get into that here in just a second, it's five to 10 minutes away from my house. Okay, now here's the thing. The Deer Creek School District, if you don't live in Oklahoma, you don't know about it, but Deer Creek is in the top 10 school districts in the state of Oklahoma, regardless of the of the list that you look at, okay? So Edmond, which is the town I live in, is typically number one or number two, and then you've got Deer Creek that's also in the top 10. And so we have people that are moving from all over the state, really from all over the place, into this area because they want to be in the Edmond Public School District and the Deer Creek Public School District, okay? It, it's an incredibly desirable school district for these parents to move to. So I got reached, uh, a guy reached out to me who listens to this show because he was forwarded a letter, an email from a parent basically saying, hey, this is crazy. How can I get this information out to more people? So I'm going to be leaving names out of this because I, I can't you know, violate confidentiality. There's some things going on behind the scenes that I can't really talk about, but I am going to talk about it in general. Okay. So there was an email that a father of a student sent to the teacher that was teaching his student. Okay. So again, I'm leaving names out, but I'm just going to read you the email that he sent to the teacher and the response from the teacher. So this is the email to the teacher from the father. Good evening, teacher's name. This is the parent's name, the student's father. It was nice meeting you today, and the student is really excited about being in your class. I have a quick question. When reading the, quote, just a few things, quote, memo, I was concerned with the section titled Critical Literacy. While several of the topics I feel are appropriate and well-intentioned, some of the other topics I do not feel are appropriate for this age group. Is the curriculum that was designed or is this curriculum that was designed by the school district or are you in control of all the learning material? Okay, so now let's get into the response from this teacher to the father. Okay, good evening, Mr. Blank. Thank you for sharing your concerns and it was wonderful meeting you as well. I do want to assure you that the conversations are very child friendly and the critical literacy books are picture books written for this age. There is not a district reading list, but we do practice inclusive literature as a means to honor all diversities. I do not ever impose my personal beliefs or try to change other children's beliefs when having discussions with students, but I do try to read books that relate to all the unique needs of all of my students each year. It is important all students and families feel honored and the children hear stories that they can relate to as well as ones that are different as this helps the child build, uh, this helps build the children's perspective, taking and acceptance of others. The list I provided is a general list, and I do not necessarily read all the books every year. If there are some specific choices you are concerned about, I am more than happy to discuss them further with you. I know many of the topics seem heavy, but you would be surprised what kids this age are drawn to. For example, The Lemonade Club is a story about a girl who has cancer. In the story, her classmates show their support for their friends by shaving their heads after they learn that their friend is scared to go to school after her chemo treatments. She loses her hair and is afraid of what her friends might say. When she returns to school for the first time, she is welcomed with a class of hairless friends. In my class, I am usually stopped as the children are all wondering when she will get her hair back. They usually are not caught up uh, in what cancer is or ask me to explain that. We talk about how her classmates showed kindness. I asked them if they would be willing to do something like that for their friend. Most of them say no, and we talk about why our hair is so important to us. We also talk about how the girl was feeling and a time when my students were worried about something about someone else uh, about what someone else thought of them. In this example, I can also tell you that in the past three years, I have also, or I have had almost half of my class know someone or a relative dealing with cancer, and it has been a way for them to realize that they are not alone, and we may, and we may all face something this scary. How do we deal with that, and how can we help our friends who need us? 
Side note, I never encourage them to shave their heads, but the illustrations from the story are so heartwarming. I can assure you that all the conversations are very G-rated and appropriate. Winky face. If you have any specific concerns, I am always available to discuss them with you. Okay, so a few problems with this email. Okay, and then we'll get into the actual attachment. So there's this quote. There is not a district reading list, but we do practice inclusive literature as a means to honor all diversities. So again, the words inclusive and diversity should not be trigger words, but they are today. Because that doesn't mean a lot of things. It basically means one thing, and it's one segment of diversities. There's another quote, quote, I do not ever impose my personal beliefs or try to change other children's beliefs when having discussions with my students, unquote. Yeah, if you believe that, I've got some oceanfront property in North Dakota that I can sell you. Another problem from this is this quote here. It is important all students and families feel honored and the children hear stories that they can relate to as well as ones that are different, as this helps to build children's perspective taking and acceptance of others. Again, the word acceptance there is another issue. Because in modern parlance, that is accepting of a particular category of people and their particular worldviews, right? Another quote here, I know many of the topics seem heavy, but you would be surprised what kids at this age are drawn to. Oh, do they seem heavy? Do they seem heavy? I wonder how you got that idea. And the last thing here, I can assure you that all the conversations are very G-rated and appropriate. Winky face. Again, if you're typing an email as a professional and you use a winky face, you know, I in general have problems with that, but I just love how they're just letting you know, hey, this is very, very G-rated. You know, we're not getting into crazy issues here. But now let's get into the attachment. Oh boy, the attachment. Okay, so I'm not going to read the entire attachment. I'm just going to read the, the section in question, which is the critical literacy section. Okay, so here we go. At least once a week, students will be read a story that reflects real world events. The topics range from cancer, racism, injustice, suffering, bullying, poverty, or diversity from multiple perspectives. Now, just as a quick aside here, what could possibly go wrong here? I mean, teachers are doing well to get their all their class uh, mates and all the people that are in the class with them up to grade level competency. But yeah, sure. Let's let them talk about racism and injustice and diversity. Yeah, I think that's a great thing to do. Okay, we'll get back into the, to the uh, attachment here. Stories are written for children and encourage discussions of fairness, right from wrong, social injustices, and perspective taking. The skills encouraged through readings and discussions allow the children to become more socially responsible, accepting, and aware. Some of the stories will fuel service learning projects. A list of some of these types of stories is attached. Note, many of the stories are nonfiction and written based on actual events. Please feel free to explore any of these books as your chi- or with your child. Any that give you concern, please let me know. I do encourage the children to discuss difficult topics like these, and I will not impose my views. Weird. She used the exact same language in her email, but we'll keep going. Children are very perceptive and very eager to help. Be accepting of others and show compassion more often than adults. So it is important for you to listen to their ideas when reading these stories and pay attention to the details they notice. Often it is something so subtle that we might have missed and not so much the big idea of the story. Which, yeah, as an aside here, you see, you bigot. You need better. You need to be better. I need to teach you how to be a good person. And I'll do it through your kid. All right, back to the attachment. For example, in the Lemonade Club, does this sound familiar? Students and I have read uh, that are very concerned about a little girl losing her hair and how the class shaves their heads to show their compassion. They rarely even ask about cancer. They uh, want to know how long it will take for her beautiful hair to grow back. This lends itself to discussions on why our hair is so important to us and it, what it makes us who we are. Weird. It's almost like she was planning to say that because that was also in her email. Would they be willing to do the same for a friend who is sick? It helps children develop perspectives and begin to think philosophically. It is social studies, humanities, literacy, and high-level thinking, and is essential for lifelong learning. Now let's go ahead and get into the book list. So that's kind of the primer for the actual book list, okay? The Critical Literacy Book List at Deer Creek Elementary School, okay? Now this is going to be broken down by title and author, and then there's kind of an issue discussion. There's about 40 books on the list. So there's The Lemonade Club by Patricia Polacco that talks about cancer and compassion. There's a book called Those Shoes by Maribeth Boltz. Uh, it's about poverty and generosity. And then there's The Empty Pot by Demi, which is about honesty and perseverance, which obviously, you know, perseverance is like resilience. That's all great. And there's a bunch of other books that, you know, some might be suspect. They might not be suspect, but, you know, most of these you would actually have to buy and read them for yourself to evaluate the content. But there was one book 
that stuck out like a turd in a punch bowl. It was called My Shadow is Pink by Scott Stewart. Now, Scott Stewart is an Australian author who wrote this book for his son, Colm, who he says is trans. Okay? Now, I was going to summarize the book for you, but I don't want to, you know, move you in one way or the other. I'm going to actually read this book to you. Okay? It's not going to take me very long, but just follow along and see if you notice anything. Okay? So this is My Shadow is Pink by Scott Stewart. My dad has a shadow that's blue as can be, and there's nothing but blue in my whole family tree. But mine is quite different. It's not what you think. For mine is not blue. My shadow is pink. My shadow loves ponies and books and pink toys, princesses, fairies, and things not for boys. But there's one thing it likes most I have found. It loves wearing dresses and dancing around. It spins and it sparkles and it dwells through the air, then stops as my dad walks in with a glare. It will turn blue one of these days. Don't worry, he says. It's just a phase. Dad's shadow is blue. It is big. It is strong. But when I stand with it, I just feel so wrong. I wish mine was blue like all the others. I wish mine was blue like my dad's and my brother's. I'd be part of the group. Of that, there's no doubt. But I cannot fit in when my shadow stands out. Now things are all changing, and that is not cool. I'm ready to start my first day of school. The teacher has asked us to dress up with our shadow in its favorite thing. My heart skips a beat as I put on a dress and I look at my dad who is anxious and stressed. He takes me to class and I turn to say bye. His face is all worried. It's fear in his eyes. So I step in the doorway and puff out my chest. One thing is clear. I'm not like the rest. I try to say hi, but my voice is too quiet. The kids, the kids turn around in the room. It goes silent. I run out the door and I push past my dad. I run to my house, my house feeling angry and sad. If my shadow was blue, I'd be there making friends. I'd be laughing and playing and drawing with pens. I rip off my dress and throw it on the floor. I won't wear it again. Not ever, no more. Just then at my door came a soft little knock. It's my dad walking in, and I look up in shock. Both he and his shadow, in dresses they stood, with shimmering seams and pink sparkling hoods. He speaks in a voice that's quite soft but is stern. Pick up that dress. You must listen and learn. Your shadow is pink. I see now it's true. It's not just a shadow. It's your innermost you. He showed me the photos of parents and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and others. We've had a lot of shadows that's hidden from eyes. Sometimes our shadow, it lives in disguise. His shadow loves painting and fashion and art. Her shadow loves engines and powerful cars. His shadow loves dance and its tones and its swirls. Her shadow, she hides in her, it, her shadow likes girls. His shadow loves theater and acting and plays. Her shadow loves science and planets and space. Your shadow is you and pink it will be. So stand up with your shadow and yell, this is me. And some they will love you and some they will not. But those who do love you, they'll love you a lot. So put on that dress and get back to school. If someone won't like you, then they are the fool. My heart is nearly burst and my shadow it soared. I picked up the dress and wore it once more. We ran out the door, this time holding hands. My dad and our shadows, together we stand. I stride in my class and I puff out my chest. I may be different, but different is best. I join a small group, though when I don't blend, they look up and smile. Will you be our friend? Okay. So that's my shadow is pink. Now, there are a lot of stories that are out there for kids. But this one's fairly unique. Obviously, talking about transgenderism. It snuck in a line there about uh, being a lesbian, about about this woman, uh, you know, she hides uh, in her shadow and her shadow likes girls, right? But I'm going to give you a little piece of information that I didn't give you from the very top of the story. So the teacher in this story from Deer Creek Elementary School teaches, wait for it, kindergarten. Kindergarten. Five-year-olds. My shadow is pink is in a kindergarten classroom. They are introducing to five-year-olds the idea that they may not be the gender that they are. Again, a five-year-old can, you know, barely write their name and make it through the school day without crapping their pants, but Let's go ahead and introduce gender identity to them. Anybody see any problems with this? 
to my Deer Creek parents that are listening to this, which I know there are a lot of you, did you know that this was going on in your elementary school for kindergartners? Because it actually gets worse than that, guys, if you can believe it. Because I actually went to the publisher's website. That's Larkin House uh, or Larrikin House. And I found the teacher's notes that come along with this book. So this is what comes with the book to give ammunition to the teachers for what they should do to help this land even more with the students. Okay, so this is from the activities section. Draw the student's attention to the line, my shadow loves ponies and books and pink toys, princesses, fairies, and things not for boys. Get the class to work in small groups to create lists of activities and things that are not for boys. Have the groups work to create lists of activities, jobs, things that are not for girls. As a class, go through and discuss each item. Question why they think it's not suitable for that gender. Explore examples of how these lists are incorrect and discuss how gender should not play a part. Okay, and it gets better. Here's another one from this section. My shadow is pink is written in rhyming verse. Have the students write a poem about their own shadow, what they like and what makes them unique. Okay, so it's interesting that they have this activity, right? Considering that they've been given the activity after the idea has been put into their heads that they may not be the gender that they were assigned at birth, that their shadow might be a different color. So here you are saying, hey, you're going to write your own poem now. Would it be a miracle to suggest that some of those kids are going to write about how their shadow is pink when it should be blue or vice versa? And the last thing here from this section, in small groups, have the students act out the scene where the boy goes to school dressed in a dress and gets rejected by the other students. Discuss what the other students could have done or said to be more welcoming. Redo the scene with students responding in kind, welcoming and accepting ways. Okay. So that's a tough thing to get through, but I'm, I'm going to say this for, for a lot of different reasons, because I went through all these stories, spent the time going through them, including one from my backyard, because these stories communicate something and they should be communicating a lot of things to us. Okay. The first thing is that this can happen in any school district in the country. It doesn't matter if you're private or public, urban or rural, metro or suburb, red state or blue state, Christian or otherwise. This can happen in your school district. I am in a state where every single county, I think for the last three or four presidential uh, you know, uh, elections running, every single county voted red. And this happened right in the middle of the state. Another thing this should communicate to us is that your government overlords, right? They are convinced that they are better parents to your children than you are. And the, you know, the way that some of you act, to be honest, you'd think that you agreed with them. I mean, uh, these people are on a power trip and they are convinced that you can't parent them in a way that is most appropriate for the child. This was actually crazy. I think this came up last week, but in a recent gubernatorial debate in the state of Virginia. So you've got Terry McAuliffe, who's the Democratic nominee for governor of Virginia. And then you've got Glenn Youngkin, who's the Republican nominee for the governor of Virginia. They had this little back and forth. So this is Youngkin, the Republican. He said this. What we've seen over the course of this last 20 months is our school systems refusing to engage with parents. In fact, in Fairfax County this past week, we watched parents so upset because there was such sexually explicit material in the library that they had never seen. It was shocking. And in fact, you vetoed the bill, the bill that would have informed parents that they were there. You believe school systems should tell children what to do. I believe parents should be in charge of their kids' education. Okay, so then McAuliffe kind of responded to Yunkin and he kind of said a bunch of things, but this was the the important response from the Democrat. He said that he was not going to let parents come into schools and actually take books out of the library and make their own decisions. And this was the quote here. I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. That's Terry McAuliffe running for governor of Virginia. Okay. The other thing that this should communicate to us is that school boards have operated in, in relative autonomy until COVID hit, okay? There was nobody that would go to school board meetings. Nobody would ever bring up anything. Nobody would ruffle any feathers, okay? And then COVID hit, and then all of a sudden parents are paying attention. Again, that's the being asleep at the wheel thing that I talk about a lot. But these people, these school boards, they love power, but boy, do they hate attention. They do not like attention. They do not like the fact that their meetings are now going viral because these parents are pushing back. They don't like that at all, which begs the question, why don't they like that? Shouldn't they want more people to know their great ideas? If your ideas are so good and so moral, wouldn't you want to spread those ideas? But they hate it. They, they hate the fact that there's a docket full of speakers from the community. They don't like it. 
And they're trying to actually get it to stop in a lot of ways. So recently, the National School Board Association actually sent a letter. That's one of the biggest, you know, uh, school associations and you know teachers unions out there, the National School Boards Association. They sent a letter to Joe Biden demanding that the White House and the federal government send federal law enforcement uh, troops and, and officers to school board meetings to address the growing number of threats of violence and acts of intimidation across the nation. Really? Basically, they don't like that people are pushing back on them verbally, so they want to send out the troops. They want to send out police officers, federal police officers, to come in there and stop parents from speaking. So the, the reason why this is coming up for these school districts, it's, it's, it's in response to the mask mandates. It's in response to the vaccine mandates, which we're going to see a lot more of here in the coming months. I already guaranteed you that, you know, the CRT, critical race theory outrage, and this will surely be used for sexual and gender subjects as well. They don't want the communities talking about it. They want you to shut up. They want you to drop your kids off, pick them up seven or eight hours later, and just deal with the consequences and deal with the wreckage. They don't care. The other thing that it should communicate to us is that our children are being used as cannon fodder in the fight to change society. That seems a little heavy handed to say, but it's true because here's the thing, guys, if they can't bully you, the adults into complete submission, they will use your children to do it. Or contrastingly, they will simply bypass you entirely by influencing the next generation directly and cutting off your ability to have direct influence over your family tree and the direction of your family name. That's what they want to do. That they will just completely go around you. They're like, okay, you're just going to be a stick in the mud. We're not going to be able to convince you. We're not going to be able to shut this down your throat. So we're just going to convince your kids. While their brains are still developing and they're they're still developing overall, that's what we're going to do. And guys, if the K-12 through system doesn't accomplish their goal of revolution, the college and university system will finish the job. We've seen that, right? And there's a lot of guys that I've talked to individually that say, look, I'm not saving for my kids' college anymore. I'm saving for them to open up a business or to, to go into some sort of a trade school. I'm not sending them to four years of an indoctrination, right? That's not what I'm doing, right? The other thing that this should communicate to us is that as parents, right, it's our fault if we're asleep at the wheel when all of this is going on. It's our fault. You know, it's easy to kind of point around and look at other people because when you, these materials are in your kids' schools, you can have an effect on that to a degree, Right? This also includes the fact that many of you allow the state, right, the, the the government officials from the state to teach your kids about sex in general by putting them in the sex ed program. And this is this next part here is probably going to offend a lot of you. But, you know, honestly, I don't really give a crap. But this also extends out and includes giving your child a, a fully unlocked smartphone when they're in elementary school or junior high, which allows them to easily access hardcore porn whenever they want to. Right. This also includes giving them a fully unlocked personal computer and a Wi-Fi connection, which allows them to easily access hardcore porn whenever they want to. And this includes letting them have a television in their room with a PlayStation or an Xbox hooked up to the Internet, which allows them to easily access hardcore porn whenever they want to. Because it's a little rich to me that some parents want to just eviscerate these school boards, which I'm all there with you. I'm right there along with you. But then all their kids have access to hardcore porn everywhere. Because these passages in these books, the, the ideas in these books are absolutely horrific and toxic and, and could be deadly and, and they're demonic. They're all the horrible things, right? But they've got a smartphone. They've got a television in, in a room, right? So when they're done playing video games at all hours of the night, they, they're turning on their television, right? And, and all the other channels are unlocked. They have Cinemax and, and Showtime and HBO. And in the middle of the night, you know what's on those stations? Softcore porn, Right? And you're just, you're, you're, you want to fight the school board. You, so parents are either not wanting to fight at all, or they want to do the big, I'm going to go to the school board and pound my chest and talk for two or three minutes about how they're being so evil. But then in their own house, they're not doing things to protect their children. So we need to talk about that as well. But we're going to kind of get back to the main subject because it all boils down to this. Everything I've talked about up to this, to this moment and everything that I've kind of set you up with, it comes down to this. This is about sexual grooming the normalization of pedophilia and gender confusion. I'll say it again. What all this boils down to is it's about sexual grooming of children, the normalization of pedophilia and gender confusion. And to those of you saying, you know, Kyle, you know, I've been with you all the way up, up to right now, but, but this is ridiculous. I would urge you go back to episode 87 of this podcast. Okay. Go back to episode 152 of this podcast where I had to talk about pedophilia in those, in those contexts and all the different stories therein, 
But also go back to episode 116. It's called Shifting the Overton Window. For those of you that don't know what the Overton Window is, the Overton Window is basically what is acceptable in common discourse as a society. And that can shift up or down over time, you know, because, you know, 100 years ago, gay marriage, you, you wouldn't even think of a thing. But even 10 years ago, you wouldn't think about transgenderism for kids, right? But now that's kind of in the Overton window. We're allowed to talk about it, right? Think about 20 years ago. Can you imagine Drag Queen Story Hour? I was just reminded again here recently that there are places in my community that do these drag queen story hours of these these horrifically evil men that dress up like women and come in and read stories to your kids. And you're so stupid that you just drive your kids up to the library and say, yeah, this is a great idea or, or the restaurant or wherever they're going, right? Now, just go back. If you think that that's crazy, you need to go back and listen to those things and realize the world that you're sitting in right now. And also to those of you that would say this, because I can already hear it now, Kyle, are you saying that all teachers are pedophiles and sexual predators to which I would answer? Of course not. Of course not. However, every cultural and societal revolution requires two things, two things. Number one is zealots. And number two is useful idiots. And I would say a significant number of teachers in these schools are the latter. They are useful idiots. And I'm I'm not saying they're dumb as a person, but they are just allowing these things to happen. And they're allowing these things to be brought into their classrooms and the curriculums to be taught because they've been convinced that diversity is the best thing and acceptance is the best thing. And we can't really push back because that might be offensive. Okay. And gosh, I mean, the useful idiots moniker extends to parents that are asleep at the wheel as well. Like, this is absolutely true. I've already talked about the stuff you do in your own household, but it's all these useful idiots, right? Because again, if you can't contribute something to malice, you should contribute to ignorance. Everyone's heard that, right? But at some point, someone is making a decision, a conscious decision to put these materials in the classroom. And if the teachers don't stop it, if the administrators don't stop it, if the parents don't stop it, it's not going to be stopped by the kids, right? But one thing that I did as well to, to kind of give you the tools and give you access, I, I, I kind of put together a parents beware book list. Okay. And this will be in the show notes. So you don't have to pull over and try to write all these down, but here were just some of the most popular books that I found, uh, in every single one of these books, the, these are somewhat common to be found in different schools, right? You know, K through 12 and every single one of these books has some sort of perverse and or, you know, disjointed or graphic sexual content. We're talking about straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, pedophilic, rape, necrophilia, all of it. It's all in there. And so I broke up the list. There's kind of a junior high and high school list, and then there's an elementary school list. So you need to be on the lookout for these books. And we'll get more into kind of what we can do with that information here in a second. So for junior high and high school kids, the book Lawn Boy by Jonathan Evison that describes pedophilia and graphic gay sex. We have Gender Queer, a memoir by Maya Kobabe that describes pedophilia and graphic gay sex. We have Out of Darkness by Ashley Perez, which describes rape and graphic sex. My Friend Dahmer by Durf Backdurf, uh, which describes necrophilia, that's sex with the dead. In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado that describes BDSM and graphic lesbian sex. So BDSM is like, you know, bondage and torture and, you know, sex toys and all that stuff. And then we have Monday's Not Coming by Tiffany Jackson, which describes sexual assault and graphic sex. So there's are, those are some for you to be paying attention for, for middle school and high school, but here's some for elementary school. So we have my shadow is pink by Scott Stewart, which we already described transgenderism. Then we have, I am jazz by Jessica Herthel, which describes transgenderism. Then we have they, she, he, me free to be by Maya and Matthew Smith Gonzalez. I think the guy actually hyphenates his last name. What a tool. So that talks about gender identity, obviously. Then we got Prince and Knight by Daniel Hack, which describes uh, being gay. Then we have Who Are You? The Kid's Guide to Gender Identity by Brooke Pessin Webby or Webdy, who freaking cares? It's about gender identity. Then we have My Princess Boy by Cheryl Kill Davis, which is about transgenderism. And Tango Makes Three by Justin Richardson and Peter Parnell, which is about a gay family. And then Neither by Arlie Anderson, which is a book that has a lot of different themes in here as well. But guys, I wanted to give you those lists so you could be aware. So if you see any of these titles pop up that you can be like, oh, I've heard that before. I think Kyle said that. And if it was said on this podcast, it doesn't mean it's green eggs and ham. It's something worse than that. But guys, I want to bring all this down to kind of the, the, what we can actually do with this information side of things. So here are the calls to action. Okay. So I'm going to read through this list and then we'll get into some detail here, but here's, here's what you should do. Here's your call to action. Number one, come to grips with the fact that this could be happening at your child's school right now. Number two, 
Contact your children's teachers and request a comprehensive curriculum and book list for any and all content or books that will be physically, uh, that will physically be or will be discussed in the classroom. Okay. Number three, evaluate the teacher's reactions to your request. Number four, physically go into the classrooms and libraries yourself to see if that list comprehensively reflects the materials listed and present. Number five, check in with your children daily to verify the information that they're being taught. Number six, if any of these inappropriate materials are found on the cur curriculum or book lists or in the classrooms or libraries, demand to speak with the teacher and the principal or superintendent immediately and get an explanation. Number seven, if you don't get a satisfactory explanation from the teacher and the principal or superintendent and they refuse to remove the materials from school property, go to the next school board meeting and verbally set the place on fire and demand action. Number eight, if the school board refuses to remove the materials from the school property, remove your child from that school immediately. And the last one here, number nine, never under any circumstances, let your child go through any school's sexual education program, especially if you're in the public school. Okay, so now let's go back to the list and let's break it down. Number one, come to grips with the fact that this could be happening at your child's school right now. For most of you, that's all you needed to hear because you have had your head in the sand. You've had your eyes covered, your ears covered. You don't want to see any of this potential evil. But as I just explained, why do you think I took examples from red states, from Oklahoma, from Texas, right? Why, why did you think I did that? Because it can happen in your state. It can happen in your county. It doesn't matter. Red state, blue state. I've already said this. Private, public, Christian, or otherwise. These things are infiltrating the school systems. We've got to be aware. Okay? Number two, contact your children's teachers and request a comprehensive curriculum and book list for any and all content or books that will physically be or will be discussed in the classroom. Okay? So yes, I mean this for K through 12. So if you've got a kindergartner, even maybe even a preschooler, right? all the way through your 18-year-old senior in high school. You've got to get a comprehensive list, okay? And then we get into number three. Evaluate the teacher's reactions to your request. Because if they push back, they're not pushing back for a good and moral reason. To a degree, they're offended. Is it perhaps because they're hiding something from you? Because they know, because they're they're woke and they're progressive and they understand things and they're better at this than you are and this is what they do for a living. They don't need some lowly parent pushing back and checking in on them and what they're doing. Have you heard all the stories about these teachers that have parents that have kind of been li listening in on the Zoom meetings whenever we were doing Zoom calls with COVID and all that kind of stuff with the classrooms and their kids, you know, their seven-year-old is on a Zoom call for eight hours a day. And then the parents are just kind of listening being like, wait a minute, what? What are you saying to my kid? What is this assignment? And all of a sudden, all the parents woke up just like that. But the thing is, is if they push back at all, I can guarantee you that they're hiding something. Because they should, the, the answer should be, you say, hey, I would like a, a comprehensive list of everything that's going to be in the classroom and all the curriculum. They should say, okay, I'll send that right over. That should be, that is the only acceptable response. Hey, you work for me. You're the kid's teacher. You're paid by the state tax dollars. I pay tax dollars. You work for me. Send me the curriculum. And if they don't do it, big problems, okay? So, number four, you need to physically go into the classroom and libraries yourself to see if that list that you are given comprehensively reflects the materials listed. Because guys, if they're going to nefariously put these things in the classroom, wouldn't you think that they would try to hide it and not even include it in their list? And when they get called out on it, be like, oh, must be an oversight. Right. And guys, I don't care if you have to get Mission Impossible with it. If you need to secret, you go in in secret and secretively go into these classrooms and libraries to evaluate these things for yourself. Freaking do it. Do it. OK, because the evil schools or the teachers or the administrators, not obviously not all of them. They are banking on the fact that you won't do any of this, by the way. We're only on number four. Right. They're banking on the fact that you won't do this. Right. Especially if they have nefarious things in mind. They're assuming that you're just going to keep your head in the sand. And again, they've always got the, oh, it must have been an oversight. Oh, this person was supposed to put it on the list and they didn't put it on the list. Oh my gosh, we'll make the correction immediately. But these schools are being forced to take these books out of the classrooms, out of the libraries. They're not doing it voluntarily, okay? Then we have number five, check in with your children daily to verify the information that they're being taught. So this is just general good practice. And it goes beyond how is school today? Do you learn anything good? It goes beyond that. Because they're bringing their books home for the most part, unless they're being, you know, the teachers are being taught not to do that, like that uh, school district in uh, north of Austin. But again, this is beyond the trust but verify stage. 
right? I say that you shouldn't trust these teachers and these administrators at all. Screw trust, but verify, right? You need to know exactly what they're reading. Open up their textbooks. If they're reading a book for class, open it up, read it yourself. I'm assuming this is at a reading level that you can do, right? You're listening to this podcast and you understand what I'm saying. You can understand the kid's book. You need to be checking in on a daily basis. Number six, if any of these inappropriate materials are found on the curriculum or book list or in any of the classrooms or libraries, demand to speak with the teacher and the principal or superintendent immediately to get an explanation. Okay. And this is the thing that I would suggest for you to do. Again, if they push back, keep pushing, right? Don't let them be like, oh, well, they're out of town and they've got meetings. They got this. Go sit in the main office and say, I will be here until I get a meeting with the principal. It's shocking how well that works, right? Don't be rude. Don't be a jerk. Just be forceful. Okay. And here's the other thing. I would highly, highly suggest that if you get that meeting, which you should, you're entitled to that meeting, that you record it. So I've got an iPad and I've got a program on there. So when I'm at a, at a sermon or I'm at some sort of speech, I can record it as I'm writing my notes and it's great. I can go back and listen to it later. It's awesome. But you also have voice memos on your phone. And, but, but you do have to be careful about what state you live in. So I live in Oklahoma, which is a single party consent state. So I can, you know, be at coffee with somebody and be recording the conversation without their knowledge and they can't sue me. Right. So, but guys, look at your state's laws. It won't take you 30 seconds or 60 seconds to figure out what the recording laws are. And if it's legal, you should record it. And let's say you live in a state where they, they need, you know, both parties to consent to being recorded from the moment you sit down, you say, I'm recording everything that you're going to say in this meeting. Don't worry about it. And then just hit record and set it down. You don't need to have a big, long discussion about it. Just start recording. Okay. Number seven, if you don't get a satisfactory explanation from the teacher and the principal or superintendent, and they refuse to remove these inappropriate materials from the school property, go to the next school board meeting, verbally set the place on fire and demand action. Again, do what Stacey Langton did. Do what these other parents are doing. You can't let this go on silently. You can't just text a few other parents in the class. You can't just talk to your pastor about it. You can't just talk to your Sunday school. You've got to make this a big deal, right? Because it is a big deal. And that doesn't mean go in there and just hoot and holler. There's something to be said for, again, go back to the video with Stacey Langton. She was very forceful in her language, but very controlled until they started interrupting her. That's when she raised her voice. That went, That's when she took everything that she was doing and her countenance elevated and you could feel the blood boiling inside of her body. But she didn't start there. I, I, I would give you that advice if I were training you, uh, you on this is like, if you just go in there and start screaming and hooting and hollering, they can very easily tune you out. Okay. Elevate your voice and elevate your point when you're making your point. Okay. Then we've got number eight. If the school board refuses to remove the materials from school property, remove your child from that school immediately. Remove them immediately. Okay. Now you might be in a school district that doesn't allow for this kind of vile filth to be in the classroom. Okay. And if you get all the way to this step, you are in the one that allows for that, right? Because you're not even going to get to this step unless you're in one of those horrible school districts that allows this. But in fact, every single Christian listening to this, every conservative even, should at least seriously consider taking your children out of public schools, which is easy for me to say because my kids aren't in school yet, right? My son and you know my other son on the way, right? Now, I know what some of you are thinking right now as well. It wasn't a big deal when I was in school you know, what's all the fuss about? I've heard that a lot. Like, you know, I'm sure some of this stuff was going on when I was a kid, but you know, what's all the fuss about? But guys, it's not like that anymore. It's not like it was when you were in school. It's just not. Everything is political now. Everything, right? Everything in the culture war now involves your kids. The cultural revolution is flying by. It is taking off at breakneck speed, okay? And your kids are are just collateral damage, right? And just look how quickly society has shifted and subsequently deteriorated during this amount of time, right? Again, just think about what was absolutely unmentionable five years ago. Now it's common. That's the Overton window. And again, I know that some of you are going to say that you just don't have the means by which to make that happen, taking your kid out of the school, right? And to that, I would say I understand where you're coming from, but I would ask you two questions. The first is, what is your child's mind worth? And the second is, what is your child's fundamental worldview worth? Because that's what's being shaped in that school. 
the schools that allow this filth in their classrooms and libraries. What's that worth? Is it worth you or your spouse quitting their jobs to stay home and do homeschool? Perhaps. Perhaps it is. Is it worth having to invest more to put them in a private school that you get guaranteed assurances that don't allow those things in addition to critical race theory or any of that other nonsense? Is that worth it? I can't answer that question for you, but I think the answer is fairly obvious. And here's the other thing is, again, if you literally can't do any of those things, homeschool or private school, or, you know, there's no money for that. Like, I get it. You have to work your way all the way through this list. You have to be on top of it. Your kids are worth it. And again, the last thing here is never under any circumstances, let your child go through any school's sex ed curriculum, especially if you're in the public schools. One thing that you might not be shocked by, but you know, I wasn't, but maybe you will be, is that Planned Parenthood in several states across the country, hundreds of school districts, they're the ones that put together a lot of the curriculum for sex ed programs. Is that shocking to you? Because Planned Parenthood wants to make sure at an early age that you understand that abortion is basically like birth control. It's just like an expensive condom, right? A lot bloodier, right? But it's it's birth control nonetheless. But then also, we've gotten stories, I should have included one in the show notes, uh, maybe I can do that later. But we have these school districts that are in the sex ed program, they're showing these kids how to do sex acts. They're, they're having these kids act out sex acts as part of the sexual education program. That's happening potentially in your school district. Why in the world would you allow the state to teach you about, to teach your kids about sex? Again, if you're, if you're a conservative Christian, you know, family minded person, how could you possibly do that? And there are certain school districts that are not a, not allowing parents to opt out of sex ed. That's, I think I'm definitely heard that in California. The state that basically they they guaranteed across the board think they're better at this whole parenting thing than you are because they need to they need to crank out some zealots for their left wing worldview. And how do they do that? They start forcing it down their throats by the age of five. So by the time the kid's 18, they're helpless. They're gonna have to have a, a major, you know, road to Damascus conversion before they get out of that. Right. But guys, I want to kind of circle back to what we talked about at the very beginning of the podcast. And that was Proverbs 22, six, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So guys, listen to me. Your kids' school, especially if they're in the government-run public schools, are being trained up in the way they should go. That direction is in, it's in the direction of the normalization of sexual and gender perversion. Will you stand in the gap? Will you stand in the gap between these evil forces and your child? The answer is either yes or no. I feel like I've done in, in the hour that we've spent together today, I feel like I've given you all the tools necessary to at least kick off your journey. If you choose not to go on it, then I can't help you. All right, guys, before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost at Undaunted Life. Our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. And so without me listing all these, basically any YouTube video that I referred to in this podcast or showed, that's in the show notes. Any of these stories that I told you about, that's in the show notes. I've got, you know, a, a person reading that book. So if you didn't like, you know, the way that I read My Shadow is Pink, I've got a YouTube video so you can listen to it there. You can share that around to different people to be like, hey, this is what actually is in that book if you don't want to share around the show, which you should definitely do. But also the teacher's notes for My Shadow is Pink, I've got a PDF for you. It's all in there. I've got the links to the books that are in the book list. All that stuff is in there. Just go to the show notes. It'll all be there for you. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to the show. We really do appreciate it. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and review. If you want to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate, like I said about from the beginning, and keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And if you want to donate, it's www.undaunted.life backslash donate. We also want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music for our content. The intro outro track on this podcast is our song Cutting the Ties, which is off their 10th anniversary re-recording of their album Leveler. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah. Judah.